Good morning to all our clients and viewers today on the YouTube channel. Um, we have some really exciting news to share before we get into our normal webinar today. Um, with me is not Gregory and Silna, they will be joining us shortly. With me is uh, Richard uh, Votrovich from MRI. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for being with us. Um, Richard, you have some interesting news to share with, with, with us as well as with our clients and our partners. I do indeed. Um, I'm very excited to announce that this week MRI has acquired TPN. That's excellent news and um, for those who have not received um, the communication that went out yesterday, please feel free to reach out to our help desk and we will be sharing that with you as well. Um, most of those questions that you might have will be answered through that communication. But while we have you on here, Richard, um, what does it mean for our TPN clients, this acquisition? That's a, that's a great question. You know, it's a, it's a real honor and privilege to be here, um, to be in South Africa once again. And what we've done is we've looked at many, many businesses to acquire. Um, MRI acquires a lot of companies and we only pick the best of the best. Um, but what it means for all the TPN customers, it really means business as usual. Because mm. the services will continue, we will provide all the great information, you know, all the credit analysis, and the service will be provided to all the customers. You know. MRI's mission is about providing open and connected mm. solutions in the property technology space. Great. So, so um, what we're saying is, is that going forward, the TPN clients will continue enjoying the services Absolutely. that they have. Um, but what makes TPN such a good fit for MRI? It's an absolutely wonderful fit. Because of our mission about being about open and connected platforms, you know, data is what feeds those platforms. You know, the richness of the data, the data, the tenant data, the tenant analytics that you have wonderfully complement our broader portfolio mm -hmm. solutions. So together, the strength of the two is quite incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why MRI is very careful in choosing the right company to acquire. Ultimately. Th that's great and um, as our uh, clients know we, we absolutely love the data and we've always looked for the data <coughs> and it's yeah. great that that's one of the the key cornerstones that um, why MRI has been interested yes. so the overall sentiment um, since we announced it uh, early yesterday has been overwhelmingly positive um, what is the future for TPN the future for TPN is very exciting and fantastic you know you we build upon the MRI staff in South Africa we're over 250 people, 270 mm. people in South Africa now as a combined entity of MRI and TPN. We will continue to focus on client centricity, mm. the, providing the best offerings in the marketplace, providing the best data. And what we'll be able to do is leverage the size and scale of MRI for the benefit of our clients. Mm. It's all about client centricity and growing the offerings. It's wonderful to see we already have many mutual mm. clients that use our property central solution and yes. TPN. Mm. Um, and over time, we will integrate our platforms for the greater benefit of our customers. And that is our focus about mm. our customers, our client centricity, and providing you with an open and connected platform. It's fantastic to hear that, that uh, we're going to remain focused on clients and what um, their needs are. Um, I think one of the questions that came up um, during, uh, during the couple, past couple of days is to understand um, those clients that does not use the MRI property mm. management software, would they still be able to access TPN um, products? 100%, of course, yes. nothing changes. Clients can access MRI solutions, clients can access TPN solutions, and over time, we'll hopefully integrate those solutions. And interesting, it's a very good, I would like to mention the fact that we plan to do some meet MRI webinars for your customers Great. to give them the opportunity mm. to learn a bit more about MRI, how we look to integrate the businesses over time. You know, we will carefully think out the right integration plan, in terms of the people and the businesses, and we will share that in some webinars that we'll be sending out to hopefully to the client base over the coming weeks and months. That's great news, and I think it's very important for our clients to know that these get to know clients and get to know MRI. These webinars will continue as the TPN webinars that we've been doing um, on both the system training and legal training will continue. Richard, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to having you back in studio and um, seeing more of you. Um, good luck with the integration with, with TPN and MRI. Um, before we switch over um, and get our next guest on set, um, we're going to quickly show our um, current viewers what is, T uh, what is MRI, um, what you can look forward to, and why MRI is such a big player in the property market.
Welcome back. And um, as you can see with me on set is two very familiar faces and in some cases very familiar voices in the industry. Uh, with me is Silna Stein from SSLR and Gregory uh, Mazin, um, our head of legal from TP and Credit Bureau. Guys, thank you very much for joining us and what incredible news. It's amazing. I'm so excited and I'm really honored to be like the first guest after that. So thank you so much. It, I suppose it's because uh, we feel like family, but I'm very excited for you guys. Congratulations. And I think for the industry, uh, there's uh, quite a few exciting things on the way. So well done, TPN, MRI. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Silna. Gregory, I think one of the questions we have, and I'm kind of like curveballing this one, is will TPN remain as a registered credit bureau? Absolutely. So TPN is going to remain um, as a registered credit bureau. Our services, um, we're still going to be here for the industry um, under you know, MRI. But as um, an industry, you don't have to worry about TPN services changing. We are still going to be here to give full support to the industry. Thank you very much. So, guys, we're discussing a new lease agreement that we've um, launched last week, last week um, and it's called the Multilet. Now, before we get into the legal discussion um, that I know our viewers are very interested in, is... Um, there's always a reason why we introduce these, these new leases. And if you can bear with me, um, you know we are obsessed with data. And um, I'm just going to ask our producers to put up um, a slide for us. And what we're seeing here is the um, average yield over a period of time. And interesting that we see that the um, full uh, title has a trend of down going downward. Um, we have seen a slight uptick in the sectional title. Um, but you could still see there's quite a, quite a bit of a curve that comes through. Now, there's two reasons for this. The one is that we see, if, um, if we can put up slide two for me, please, is that house price inflation has increased. We've seen escalations kind of taking a dip during COVID. It's only stabilizing now. However, the house price, um, FNB house price index show that there's been property inflation. The property inflation, therefore, of course, when you start working out your yield, puts a bit of pressure on our, on our returns. Therefore, what can um, some of our landlords do, especially if they've got full title properties, um, do to improve their returns? And um, in discussions with, with both of you, we came up with the uh, multi let lease agreement and we'll explain a little bit later how this will help you improve your return on investment. So I think the first question that we want to answer is, is that why did TPN add this as a completely separate document. And maybe Gregory, if you can answer that one for no us, problem. that would be great. So this document, it very specifically covers a situation where you have a landlord that owns an entire building that's gonna be segmented into various units that they can rent to individual tenants. So a couple of examples that we could use are, uh, a lot of young professionals nowadays are moving into house shares. Um, there are landlords that own entire buildings that have multiple units. This allows the landlord to cover things like common areas where in a, a building you have, you know, you've got your corridors outside, mm. in a house share you've got shared kitchen space or gardens. Um, and having specific requirements and needs for a lease agreement that sort of moves away a little bit from our standard terms to a more specialized um, approach. So we have introduced that to cover that market of people that need it. Thanks. So one of the big questions, therefore, is, is that we've introduced this new lease agreement, and still now if you can maybe answer this one for us, is what is the benefits of a multi-let lease for landlords specifically? Exactly. So, so actually how this, this happened is obviously as a result of my uh, very joyful c uh, connection to, to the industry, and I've realized this is happening more and more. So mm. one of the biggest things that we have that's different in a multi late lease situation, a shared accommodation situation, compared to a freestanding full unit or a unit in a sectional title scheme, whatever, where a family lives together, mm. is suddenly we have multiple people from different backgrounds, from different, mm. you know, people do different things. And if you're in a family setup, everybody must, must sort of deal with each other. <laughs> and luckily there's shared genetics, so the kind of things that bothers them and doesn't bother them tend to be the same. But in a multi led situation, you have a commune set up or you have a mm. building with people coming in and out. 
it's different because it's different people. And a landlord struggles because the moment mm. you have two neighboring tenants, be it in a room, be it in two uh, unit next to, uh, units next to each other, the landlord's the one that's faced with the problem about mm. this one cooking something that smells horrible <laughs> or this one playing loud music or whatever. And it becomes a landlord problem. And the problem for the landlord is here, obviously, um, one of the tenants will cancel the lease agreement, vacate, the landlord suffers damages. So it's a different way of renting. And for a landlord, the benefit in using a lease agreement that's specifically w with this kind of communal living in mind, it allows things um, th that would protect the landlord and protect the landlord's investment. And I see more landlords coming in to the market, mm -hmm. straight into multi led kind of renting, more than what we've seen in the past. So I see less conversions from landlords with portfolios where they rent out um, units that they convert to multi -let. I actually mm -hmm. see quite, I see that as well, but I see a lot of landlords coming mm -hmm. into the market with um, mm -hmm. coming in as multi led landlords. Mm -hmm. And I think it's brilliant. That's mm -hmm. what we want to see, right? And, and, and that's backed up with what we're seeing within and specific rental brackets good standing um, from the 7,000 to the 12,000 is performing uh, in terms of good standing better than what we've seen pre-COVID. And the reason for that um, is that the new trend of um, young professionals deciding that they would rather take a two or three bedroom mm -hmm. apartment, um, share the cost, um, it becomes um, cheaper for them. Um, and of course that helps a lot of our landlords and, 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 and rental agents achieve higher returns. Um, and just to maybe explain the case study here is that if you have a three bedroom house, um, you would normally rent that out for 9,000 for argument's sake. Um, now you've got three bedrooms and you rent that out for 4,000. That gives you a return of 12,000. Um, and that's kind of the basic um, um, maths that um, improves your, your ROI. Um, so now, while we're on the topic of benefits, so we've spoken, at, we've spoken about the landlords mm. and what's in, in it for them. <coughs> How does this benefit a tenant? Well, the thing is, for a tenant, the, the benefit just, just on mathematics, even that mathematics makes sense in lawyer brain, <laughs> and for lawyer mathematics to make sense, you agree, yeah, it's quite, quite something. something yeah. But um, for the tenant, obviously, it's more cost effective to, <coughs> to rent like that, mm. but to live in a communal living space gives you a sense of safety. I think there's a lot of young mm. professionals that doesn't live in the traditional setup, that mm. doesn't um, get married at a young age and, and move into the typical family setup as we've seen um, in mm. the past. And people don't want to be alone. Mm. They want to be with people, but they want to be safe with people. Mm. The last thing you want is to move into a communal living space for safety purposes, and I'm speaking as the only girl on the couch here, uh, typically the ladies, we don't like living alone. It's horrible to go get home alone and it's dark and it's not fun. If you know there's somebody else there, but you need to make sure it's safe. And I think that was one of our main drivers. Yes. Um, you, you and I have spent hours and hours and hours on this lease agreement. And that was one of our big drivers to how do we protect the tenant? How do we protect the landlord's investment? But how do we protect the tenant's safety, actual safety and um, living harmoniously is, is the main theme of this lease agreement. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And then just to add to it a little bit, another benefit obviously for the tenants is that you get a bit more for what you pay for. Mm -hmm. So to use Valdi's maths, if you're paying uh, 4,000 Rand for one bedroom in a three bedroom property, but you've also got a nice big kitchen, you've got a pool outside, you've got all of these extra amenities that are included in your property, where instead you could very easily be paying 5,000 Rand for a one bedroom shoebox or even a mm. studio place somewhere mm. that you don't get those extra benefits. You might have yes. a very small kitchen, no garden space. So you get more for what you're paying for mm. as well, which is a benefit for a tenant. Obviously. Oh yes, and, and it's yeah. a, so there's a good balance between the benefit for tenants and landlords. And why we raise these conversations around tenants is uh, the property practitioners going out there, um, it's, it's how do you sell um, a rental if it is a multi led property and, and these kind of benefits become more and more important. We even see that in our tenant surveys where the number one ranking consideration is safety and security. Yes. We quickly touched base on, on harmony within the property and um, this question um, will, will, you know, I think a lot of our landlords will have these questions um, and how do we manage and create house rules? 
and what does that specific document, the role it plays within this lease agreement? Gregory, if you maybe mm -hmm. can take this one for us. So in a similar way as you would if you were renting in a sectional title scheme where you have an obligation to include your set of body corporate conduct rules mm -hmm. as an annexure to the lease, when you mm -hmm. sign a multi-let lease with your specific tenant that's moving into a room, you can include a set of house rules that are attached specifically to your lease agreement, mm -hmm. and those then become binding. As they've mm -hmm. been received by the tenant, they are bound by those rules that you have for your house. So if you have a situation where a tenant is breaching those house rules, it's effectively considered a breach of your lease as well. Mm -hmm. And then you have a recourse that you can take in the future if you need it. So it also then helps mm -hmm. eliminate a lot of those arguments, those common arguments that might happen with a next door neighbor where you don't have a shared set of house mm -hmm. rules, where you have one document that everyone needs to comply with you have it in black and white of exactly how you need to behave within this, this unit that you're in. Mm. And I think the way we've, uh, we've drafted it makes it so individualized mm. for every landlord. Because mm. if you look at the kind of landlord we're talking about, every unit, every um, set of properties he's renting out has a unique kind of tenant. And mm. if you have a bunch of young adults, you're probably going to have to deal a little bit less with things like, please don't be, you know, noisy in the evening because your young adults typically just starting out working. They're working so hard they don't have time for anything <laughs> other than, you know, watching Netflix in the evening. <laughs> so they probably shouldn't be a big problem. Where if you have a, a setup where you might have younger people, not necessarily student accommodation, but more commune accom accommodation with much younger adults, mm. um, you might have to deal with different kind of rules. And a landlord might not know this in advance. A landlord might not know what exactly he has to deal with. And because the house rules is defined as rules that can be amended during the subsistence of the lease, mm. a landlord can change and adapt and it makes the document agile for him to navigate through his investment without yeah. having to change lease agreements constantly, mm. upsetting the tenants. So you just change your house rules, you notify the tenants, mm. and your entire lease agreement effectively change. Um, and it makes it safe. So if you realize, mm. oh goodness, okay, this bunch, we're struggling with them, they're taking each other's milk out of the fridge. <laughs> you amend your rules and you bring that in without rocking the boat too hard for all the tenants. So I think it's, mm. a, it's a very agile way mm. of dealing with the lease. And I think, Silna, you made a very important distinction there, that this multi-let lease agreement doesn't replace the student lease agreement that we already yes. have. This mm. is very much aimed at a multi-let situation. When it comes to students, you have additional such things such as uh, parents signing on behalf of students mm. at university, mm. that sort of situation. Your student lease for student accommodation is still the best lease to use. This is for the very specific situation of mm. a multi-let scenario. I think that's a very important uh, yes. point to clarify mm -hmm. for, uh, for our viewers, is, is that there's, there's the student, if this does not replace the student lease, this is a completely new lease that's introduced. But talking about house rules, and, and, and this is, is something that I think does not relate specifically to multi-let, it can be expanded. For instance, um, you allow for, for pets, but mm -hmm. only cats, um, but you don't allow for dogs on the property. Are you allowed to have those kind of rules in the house rules? And I'm specifically referring to because it's been, it's been raised on various platforms. Well, you are. Your house rules, as long as, remember, the, the big thing we always need to consider is Section 12 of the Constitution. We're not allowed to discriminate against a person unfairly. Now, as much as I am a severe animal lover, it's an absolute crisis in my life. It, it looks like I live in the ark. It's not necessarily a thing for everybody. And animals doesn't enjoy the same protection around discrimination as people do. Mm. So you're not allowed to discriminate ever in your lease agreement, in your house rules mm. against a person for any thing that makes them who they are. So race, gender, religion, those kind of things, that's part of who mm. you are. Um, you're not allowed to, to discriminate <coughs> against a person for that disability, whatever the case might be. Animals, however, those kind of <laughs> rules, a landlord can definitely say, mm. you know what, we can deal with a dog, a small dog for, for somebody, but no mm. cats, because we know you can't keep a cat you can't tell a cat where to stay a dog, at least you can try. And there's an honest attempt to try and get a dog yeah. to do what you want him to do. A cat's not going to listen. Or at the same time, you can tell somebody, 
at a specific time in the evening we need to to mm. reduce the sound that's not discrimination it's regulating mm. harmonious living and you're allowed to do that most definitely or you're allowed to say no pets but once you've said people can have pets you can't change your mind and say oh no actually new plan uh, mm. you need to get rid of your pets immediately you are as in sectional title allowed to change mm on reasonable notice mm. but then you need to allow the pets that's already there to remain mm. there until sadly the mm. rainbow bridge um, but uh, so that's uh, that's something you can do but the, the really the rights of of the tenant um, rocking mm. the boat too mm. hard mm. is the legal term there. I think an extra thing just to add on to that as well is if you're renting let's say you've got a three-bedroom property within a sectional title unit and you have a set of house rules for your each individual person that's renting one of those bedrooms make sure that your set of rules is compliant and aligned with your body corporate mm. conduct rules as well Th so that's you very don't, important you yes. don't want to have something in your body corporate conduct rules as an owner saying you can have dogs in the property uh, sorry in your in your multi let rules that say you can have a dog in the property when your sectional title rules say no dogs mm. that's just going to land you in trouble with the body corporate, body corporate. so mm. you've got to make sure that you align correctly but one distinction there is that the body corporate might allow for cats to be in the premises, but you, as a homeowner, are not as bound by sectional title Correct. laws for mm. that. So mm. you mm. can say no cats, where a body corporate can't unreasonably withhold Withhold consent. permission. So, sorry, sorry. Yeah, well, continue, continue. Well, continue. we're talking about rules, <laughs> yeah. and I love talking about yes. rules. So before we move away from the rules, I think something important for our viewers and uh, the mm. users of the lease packs to, to keep in mind is in terms of Section 5.8 of the Rental Housing Act, as much as we say in the lease agreement, it must be attached. It's not us that thought, mm -hmm. you know what, this would be fun. Let's attach stuff to the lease agreement. <laughs> in terms of Section 5.8 of the Rental Housing Act, if you have rules, conduct rules, house rules, that aren't physically attached to your lease agreement, they are unenforceable mm -hmm. against the tenants. Mm -hmm. So this is important, especially when you, we are so heavily reliant on house rules as in the multi mm. lease, mm. make sure you attach it. We really, I promise, we didn't put it in there <laughs> just to entertain you with more things to your lease agreement. If it's not there, it's unenforceable mm. against the tenants. So exactly. then, if you, for instance, attach it to mm. one of your tenants' lease agreements um, and you forget about the neighbor, and this would also, this is how Murphy's gonna do it, <laughs> it's gonna be the problem tenant that it's not gonna yeah. be attached to. And the one tenant's gonna say, but why are you enforcing rules against me but not against mm. my neighbors. So multi-led landlords, uh, be very, very, very careful and make sure that you do physically attach them uh, to your lease agreement. Make sure you have the right documentation in place. And we keep saying that it's all good and well until we have to um, deal with certain situations. Then having those right documents in place um, makes yeah. a world of difference. So um, I want to move on and to understand, for instance, so what happens now that we have three people, they have signed the lease agreement and one of the tenants decides to cancel or the lease is cancelled. How does that impact the validity of the lease agreement? Mm. So this is obviously where a big difference comes in between multi-let and your normal lease agreement. Mm. If you have three tenants on your normal lease agreement and one of those tenants decides to cancel their lease by giving their 20 business days notice in terms of the Consumer Protection Act, your entire lease is effectively going to be cancelled at the end of those 20 business days. Mm -hmm. Now you've got to go through the admin of trying to sign back up those other two tenants that are in the property and it becomes an entire palaver for yourself. Whereas if you have a multi-let lease and one of your three tenants that you have elects to cancel the, the agreement, they are cancelling their agreement for their room. So you still have valid and binding leases in place with your other two tenants and you also get the benefit of receiving that rental income knowing that you Correct, have a binding yes. agreement mm. obtaining that rental. So you're only partially vacant, you therefore still generate some sort of cash exactly. um, into you know, coming in, um, although you've, 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 you've lost a, a tenant, mm. you're not completely vacant. And you have the benefit now, of just vetting that one tenant for that one room. Mm. Perfect. So in terms of the communal areas, um, who's responsible for maintaining it? Well, luckily, that's a very, very easy answer. In general, okay, so all maintenance, all maintenance in rentals, the rule is very simple. Fair wear and tear maintenance, landlord. On the go, stuff that breaks, whether that breakage is negligently or intentionally by the tenant, is for the tenant's account. So communal areas, we can bring that same rule into it. So your mm. common areas, 
if one of the tenants breaks something there, it would be for his account. But now the tenants doesn't have to share that, because remember, there are multiple tenants. If the one breaks the microwave door off, it's going to be obvious. Everybody's going to know, okay, it was that one, we heard it, everybody knew about it, and he has to replace the microwave in the communal kitchen. Yeah. However, your fair wear and tear maintenance is obviously still landlord obligation, and in a multi let accommodation situation, your fair wear and tear is probably going to be a bit quicker than it's going to be in a family situation because there are more people using the same area. Mm. So yes, as much as a garden, for instance, usually you, you don't need to worry too much about walkways and mm. things that happen. If there are more people living in a property, the maintenance by the landlord is going to be more often. So the same rules going to apply to every part of the property. And this is from the Rental Housing Act as well as the Unfair Practice Regulations to the Act. Very clearly, communal areas still, fair warranty, landlord mm. obligation, on the go breakage, on the go maintenance, short term consumables would be for the tenant. But now short term consumables is something because yeah. typically if we rent out a property. So and maybe just define light, what are short term mm. consumables. So maybe just for, for yes. my insights. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very, that's yeah. important. And short term consumables is actually a defined term in terms of, uh, of all the lease back leases. It is something that has to re be replaced on a regular basis and mm. regular is a, is a term that depends on what it is. A fluorescent light, for instance, regular is once every five years. Okay. A normal globe is something that has to be potentially be replaced every, what, how often oh. do you replace that? Say three or six months. So it depends on the specific thing. Switches, fuses, things Batteries like that. Batteries and TV remote for a, um, for a furnished property, stuff yes. like that. All stuff right. that's gonna wear down very okay. quickly. Um, and it's easy to easy to replace. Exactly, yeah. and that's something in your specific unit, so in your room, in your part, you're gonna have to replace that. You are the tenant there and you will have to replace it. In the communal living areas, that's something that you would typically deal with, either in terms of the house rules, but my, my practical advice for a landlord would actually be to consider those short-term consumables in communal living areas um, it, it would be safer for a landlord to be responsible for the replacement and repair of that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're going to work that into your calculation on how much you are charging per tenant mm -hmm. so that you can actually cover that because that's going to be one of those things where a landlord can pick up a massive fight with all the mm. tenants about one globe and you sit with vacancies because of a globe. So <laughs> I would avoid a situation <laughs> like that. Yeah. And just as a, a hypothetical to sort of add as well, where you have damage that is negligent, but you know, people don't own up. Let's say it's two o'clock in the morning, the microwave door slams and breaks. <laughs> you come out of your room and all you see is closed bedroom doors and you don't know who it is. Yes. The landlord can build into the rules that, you know, in the event that they don't know where the negligence arose from, that it can be a shared expense between yes. as a um, mm. yeah, shared use of the common area. Yes. Sort of so once again, it comes back <laughs> to having those house rules in place. Exactly. So there's one of, the, one of the last questions before we go back to um, our, our Q&A, and um, I'm sure we have quite a lot of questions, um, is in terms of a, a tenant failing to pay. What are the next steps? How does one treat and deal with it in a multi-let lease agreement? So again, this is quite similar to your cancellation in a way. Mm. You have an individual contract with each of your tenants. So where, um, in, if you're renting with one lease agreement to everyone, everyone would be jointly and severally liable, but you haven't received your whole rental. With your tenants, each tenant is responsible to pay you. You don't get one payment. Mm. So if one of your tenants in a unit doesn't pay, you can proceed with collections against that specific tenant. You can issue your letter of demand to that tenant, but whilst you're waiting for that payment to come through, you are getting your payments from your other two or three tenants, yes. whoever else is in there. So you're not stuck in a situation where you have no rental income. Mm. You're at least got a bit of cash flow coming in. You, you're covering some expenses whilst you then carry on your collection process mm. against your one individual tenant that you have a lease with. And also then, if they fail to pay, 
that one individual tenant's lease can be cancelled in terms mm. of the Consumer Protection Act. So then that person can be, um, is, will vacate the premises, or if they don't vacate the premises, Silna and SSLR can help them vacate the premises. <laughs> and encourage then, them. Encourage. Legally. Legally. <laughs> and then um, you will have the ability to place a new tenant mm. and run your vetting on one single person and place them in the unit. What? So it's safe to assume, sorry Silna, to, <laughs> to then say, also say, ensure that that tenant's um, data is uploaded into exactly. the TPN Credit Bureau. That will allow you to um, list them. Um, and ensure you can collect your, your rental um, if they don't pay um, and the blacklisting takes place. Within 12 months, they need, they need to make payment before we lift it. So you can therefore ensure that each of your tenants is uploaded um, into TPN Credit Bureau to ensure that they get their individual SMSs for the rent that they are responsible for. Um, before we jump into our uh, Q&A, um, just for our viewers, we will be posting the feedback form. Please complete that um, for your unverified CBD points. Um, that will be um, coming on to the chat shortly. It will be open for one hour. Please remember to like and subscribe um, the YouTube videos um, as well as then explore some of the other videos that we've recorded. Um, last question before we, um, we get to Rowan um, in terms of the questions. Surety ship, how does that work within a multi-let lease agreement? Well, exactly the same as it would in any, in any other lease agreement. So remember, it's crucial to have your deed of surety as a separate document. So mm. it's going to be absolutely no different from, from any other mm. lease agreement. It's mm. important to have that because if, especially in more inner city buildings, we see that quite often where there is a surety standing in for the tenant, make mm. sure that you have a separate deed of surety. And as soon as the tenant doesn't pay his rent, obviously you can go to the surety. Make sure you don't take too, too long to act against the tenant, mm. that's what I wanted to mention on the cancellation, mm. especially in a multi-let situation. Mm. To act against tenants actively and on cancellation, demand that they vacate, and if they don't, um, instruct an attorney to commence with that eviction. I think that's what you meant there. Um, yeah. So commence with an eviction application immediately because a landlord can sit in a situation with a tenant, the one that didn't pay, he doesn't, doesn't get evicted, mm. and you create this entire mm. thing. Mm. So sureties are fantastic to collect a rare rental from. Mm. It's mm. a fantastic idea, but don't wait in a, in a multi-let especially mm. to commence with a legal eviction application. Because you set an example, you create a precedent. Yes, exactly. Where you say, well, I'm paying my rental on time, the person staying opposite me, which is enjoying the benefits of all the communal spaces, exactly. they're not paying. And mm -hmm. there's a very big risk then that the, um, you know, kind of the, the word spreads. Yes. And, um, and th that's once again, very important why, you know, uploading the data into TPN Credit Bureau, making sure your of demands are sent out, making sure that you commence the eviction process as soon as possible. I just once again, emphasize the importance, especially in the, in the multi let lease agreement. And again, much like all leases, when if you've got rent that is due on the first, you are entitled to send your letter of demand on the second. There's, mm. not a, there's not a period that you have to wait. You don't need to give any other additional chances and say, okay, they're just a little bit late. Be, be proactive and take those steps. So if your rent is due first, you get in touch and you send a letter of demand on the second. Great, thank you. Rowan, we must have quite a few questions. Great, yes, we definitely do. Um, I think starting off is just a bit of clarity is would you sign one multi let lease per tenant or one per property? So you have mm -hmm. multiple tenants on the one document or one tenant per document? So this is a document that you as a landlord, you're going to have a separate lease agreement with each of the tenants that are in the units. So for unit one, two, three in my property, I have a lease agreement with unit one, with unit two, and with unit three. Mm. You're not going to list all of your tenants on the same lease because then again, if one of those tenants cancels, that whole lease gets cancelled. Exactly. Where if you keep it separate, you do mm. individual vetting and individual um, affordability checks on each of those leases, mm. you run your credit checks, and then you make sure that that one lease is signed by that one tenant. Perfect. Thanks, Greg. And then also, uh, does the properties need to be zoned for uh, a specific reason or is a community property? I think so it depends. Maybe. It Well, look at me now. I wish <laughs> I was a town planner in this moment. But, <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, practically, the answer is simply um, if it's a, a multi-let lease in the context of a three bedroom house mm -hmm. that you're renting out to three individuals, it's not going to affect your zoning. It's only when you start mm -hmm. um, uh, rebuilding and rezoning where you have 
higher density um, occupation on a property than what you would typically have. And high density, luckily, in our context is, uh, is pretty high while it's still family um, and it's still zoned for race one typically. Yeah. But yeah. the moment you start adding to that and your, mm. your typical um, occupation goes to, uh, you extend beyond, say for instance, 60% after Earth, you mm. might have to get in contact with a town planner there and they will help you out. But in most cases, you would be, you would be fine with the um, normal residential mm. zoning. Perfect, thank you, Solna. Then also, can you indicate and say that it'll, uh, it is a, a ladies only commune as they are sharing bathrooms or something? So that's what obviously. Mm. It's a very saying. interesting question because uh, yeah. it, it's, it's also can, should you get informed tenants um, about the new person entering the premises? And I think these two questions combined is can you say female or male only commune? And um, should you then need to replace a tenant, do you need to get permission or inform the other tenants of the new tenants coming in? That's a fantastic question. Mm. I'll, I'll, I think I'm the safest <laughs> one to answer this one. <laughs> so, um, Section 12 of the Constitution does say you're not allowed to discriminate mm. against somebody based on gender. However, now we come to Section 37 and a balance of rights. So this opens a door to what about then a transgender person? Um, how do we feel about that? The truth is I, um, I can see why there would be some logic behind a, a gender specific and let's just call this by this by here. It would typically be a female only accommodation. Mm -hmm. I can see that there could be a balance of rights with Section 37 of the Constitution yeah. in mind. I can understand that, but you need to be very careful. careful. I think it's not a question I'm going to want to answer, a blanket answer on a webinar like mm. this. I think maybe rather that's the moment where you get in contact, TPN out there, SSLR. Um, let's look at the specifics of the, of the commune, the reason why you do that and um, how we're going to assist around that. Because mm. very often discrimination could be fair discrimination, but mm. we need to look at the actual facts and the mm. actual reasoning behind that. Exactly. But definitely, uh, one tenant won't have the right to tell the landlord that he may or may not place another tenant that's, uh, that's far outside of his, his rights. You right. will typically inform the tenant, the other tenants, by a letter or whatever, oh, let's welcome the new mm. one, let's say hi to room number three, <laughs> uh, you know, something like that. Yes. <laughs> All right, so but there, there's, there's, there's no obligation to, mm -hmm. to, in, to inform um, who the new tenant is or and it's, it's structured yeah. around. All right, exactly. thank so you. Again, if in doubt, just send an email, legal at tpn.co.za. We'll happily look at your specifics of your matter and give you some um, specified advice on that. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you for that, Silma. Um, the next one we got is, should the multi-let lease be used on a block of flats or do we just stick to the normal residential lease? So I think they're asking for a scenario of when this lease applies. It, it depends very much on what that block of flats is. If you're a single landlord owner who owns an entire block of flats and you want to have your own rules in place, then absolutely use the multi-let lease mm. because you want to then um, you want to be dealing with these things like your attached house rules specifically. Mm. If you own multiple units within a sectional title complex, that's a slightly different scenario potentially. So yes, again, make sure if you're in doubt, you can get in touch with us. We'll look at what your landlord owns and we'll, we'll mm. give you specified advice. But for the most part, if you're the owner of an entire block and you're renting a unit, different units within that block, use the multi-let lease. Perfect, thanks Greg. Then a question we are getting a lot um, is with how would you address prepaid electricity in the property and water? Who pays what portion? How would you deal with the situation? This is a quite a quite a good one. Um, so you can set this out again in your you can set this out again in your house rules. So yeah. you can specify that um, prepaid it'll either be prepaid and then your 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 individual units can sort out between themselves how they're gonna manage their own electricity usage. Or if it's not a prepaid unit and you get billed, you can stipulate mm. that it'll be a shared mm. amount um, equally between the parties, and they can then also work together to ensure that no one's abusing that, um, abusing mm. those utilities. Um, you know, it's it's probably going to be very rare that you're going to have a, in, let's say, a commune, a individual prepaid meter for each yeah. bedroom. It's no, not going to happen. No. Mm. Um, if you're in a big block of flats, you can. Yes, it definitely, works. and I recommend that. 
Yeah, and, 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 flats, and, exactly. and you know, if, if you do have a prepaid meter, you can say the, the landlord would top it up and then recover uh, you know, a portion based on pro rata share. That yes, can be based exactly. on per room. It can be based on your room size, portion. GLA and pro rata that. Yeah. Um, so it feels fair. Um, also in terms then of like pools and stuff, then at least the, the yes. electricity is covered by those people that, that use it. And as a landlord, you don't have variable cost. Um, I want to ha ask one question and, 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 and it's like, <laughs> How, how does the multi-let lease agreement deal with um, commissions for property practitioners? Um, how is that structured? Um, what happens if a tenant is, is then brought in halfway? Maybe just give um, some clarity on, on how commissions are dealt with in a um, multi-let lease agreement. So I would deal with it exactly as I would in any other situation. I think my, my starting point, and I think everybody's going to change my name from Silna to the mandate pushing one and <laughs> um, the thing is it's about your mandate agreement your mm. mandate is going to be with your landlord and the landlord is obviously now a multi-let owner so he has multiple units you're going to list it in the mandate and say these are the units that i am going to market and rent out on uh, uh, on your behalf uh, find you uh, potential tenants for that place and every time I place a tenant, this is how I will be remunerated. Mm. So X percent mm. for the term of that lease. And I would deal with that in a very specific way in a mandate agreement. Mm. You might not want to have an individual mandate per individual yeah. room. I mean, that's going to be a little silly. Mm. But you're going to list the rooms and you're going to deal with how you're getting paid in your mandate. And guys, I am just quickly going to be that pain. Remember, in terms of Section 67 mm. of the uh, Property Practitioners Act, there is absolutely no doubt, and after our um, conversation with Delhi okay. uh, from the PPRA in our previous session, we all on the same page, mandate agreements will have to be in writing. Get it in writing, tell your landlord, unfortunately, Mr. Landlord, I can't accept a mandate without my mandatory disclosure form, without my mandate agreement, mm. In doing so, you protect both the landlord and yourself as the property practitioner. So the answer is, well, you have a proper mandate. mandate. Yes. <laughs> and especially now when you need to eliminate any doubt in the situation. If you're exactly. going to get paid a set fee for management of an entire building, mm. have that in writing. Yes. You don't want to be oh, dealing goodness, on a handshake yes. for that. And you can then get a little bit of procurement commission for every single unit that you place. But yes. I agree with you, Silna, and I'm going to push it as well with the mandate agreement. <laughs> so I'm not, I don't want to feel out, so I'm going to say you can find the mandate <laughs> agreement as part of the uh, TPN SSLR um, lease pack. You can also find, if you're already a subscriber, you can download it from the TPN shop. Um, we have come to the end of our webinar, and it has been a fantastic conversation. And um, appreciate you guys always sharing your, 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 your insights and knowledge. For those who we've, um, um, did not answer your questions, uh, please send them to legal at tpn.co.za or you can send them to helpdesk um, at tpn.co.za and we're looking forward to having you back um, with us um, on our next webinar. We've got some exciting new topics coming up um, and um, we are. Thank you very much for joining in.